Thank you, everybody, for joining us. We've got some really exciting news to share today on behalf of the University of Rochester Medical Center and our colleagues at Rochester Regional Health System. Earlier today, Pfizer announced that it was immediately starting clinical trials for a potential new COVID-19 vaccine being developed in partnership with the German biotech company. Rochester was selected as one of four locations in the U.S. to conduct this early stage research. The study, as I said, is a collaboration between URMC and Rochester Regional Health, where patients will receive the vaccine. We're joined in our studio here today by two leaders of the Rochester arm of the study, Dr. Ann Palsy, who's a professor in the Department of Medicine, co-director of our Vaccine and Treatment Evaluation Unit, um, and the uh, part of the Infectious Disease Unit at Rochester Regional Health. And Dr. Ed Walsh on the right, also with the Infectious Disease Unit at Rochester Regional Health and a professor in our Department of Medicine. I'm not sure we can see him yet, but we are extremely honored to be joined by Dr. Mike Mendoza, the Monroe County, County Commissioner of Public Health, while uh, Corey White, our Zoom Superman technician, is figuring out how to get him on screen. I'll ask um, Dr. Walsh if he wants to say a few words about the vaccine trial. Yes, we're actually quite pleased that we've been able to participate in this study uh, that is sponsored by Pfizer and the German uh, BioNTech company. So this is a messenger RNA vaccine. Uh, we're going to be using uh, several variations of this vaccine in collaboration with three other medical centers in the US. Uh, this vaccine study will start next uh, Monday here in Rochester with the uh, first uh, immunizations to take place. Uh, this is a study that is considered phase one and will uh, be act, uh, actually uh, moving forward quite quickly, uh, moving from uh, the various stages within a phase one study uh, through the uh, spring and probably into the uh, mid portion of the summer. Uh, Dr. Palsy? Um, yes, and uh, you know, I would just add to that is uh, anxious as we all are for a vaccine. Uh, this study is being constructed very carefully to proceed uh, with caution, looking at safety and uh, starting in young folks and moving up in the age spectrum um, and that we want to get the best scientific data but protect the safety of our individual uh, subjects. Thanks, Dr. Falsey. Dr. Mendoza, I'm sorry, we're having trouble seeing you, but I hope we can hear you. Would you like to uh, say anything before we get started with questions? Sure. First of all, I want to congratulate our partners at both Rochester Regional and at the U of R. Uh, today is indeed a, a momentous occasion for us because uh, we have the privilege and the opportunity and the duty of uh, participating in very important research that we know will take time. Um, but uh, even that notwithstanding, I think it's important that our community is involved in research. And to the extent possible, I'd like to ensure that all communities within our uh, community will be able to have access to participating uh, in this trial. Monroe County is fortunate to be home to two of the finest healthcare systems in the country, both the U of R and Rochester Regional. And on behalf of Monroe County, I wanna commend our partners and our local hospital systems for collaborating on this important initiative and on many projects of mutual and community-wide interest. Although our local health systems each have their unique strengths, in a time of crisis like the one we are in, I think it's important to pause and to reflect on our shared expertise and our common interests. The collaboration between these two systems during the COVID-19 pandemic has been unprecedented, and it has played a critical role in helping to flatten the curve here in Monroe County. From sharing data with the health department to delivering, uh, to developing a surge plan that thankfully to date we have not yet needed, to developing a common understanding of how to return to pre-pandemic healthcare delivery, today's news is more than an announcement of a vaccine trial, but a declaration of our shared and future potential for collaboration collaboration in times of crisis and in times of normalcy. And so with that, I wanna extend my gratitude again, both to U of R and to Rochester Regional uh, for their shared involvement, uh, both in today's trial and in our ongoing collaboration to find our way through this uh, pandemic in general. And with that, I'll turn it back over to the studio. Thank you, Dr. Mendoza. James Brown from WXXI. Do you have a question for researchers or Dr. Mendoza? Yeah, I, I guess uh, 
um, how are you able to start so quickly? Have you already got people to, who have uh, agreed to it? And uh, how many do you have if you already have people who agree? Yes, we have been screening uh, individuals by phone uh, to uh, ascertain that they uh, qualify to be in this uh, early phase study. And we are in the process of essentially lining uh, individuals up for our initial vaccinations next week. As I mentioned before, th this uh, study will involve several formulations of the vaccine at various doses and they will proceed in a sequence. And so each week uh, over the next uh, many weeks, uh, we will continue to, to vaccinate individuals uh, and screen individuals. Do you have a follow-up, James? Uh, no, I'm good. All right, Steve Orr from the Democrat and Chronicle. I wonder if, if uh, either of you could address um, if there are any potential shortcomings uh, or uh, special, any new health risks associated with uh, vaccines made with messenger RNA. So to date, there are no uh, FDA approved or licensed vaccine for messenger RNA uh, products. They have been developed though over the last a uh, number of years because of the uh, accuracy and speed at which they can be developed. Uh, they've been used in cancer research in experimental vaccines for cancer. They've also been used for pandemic influenza uh, vaccine research uh, in humans. Uh, and the concept of a messenger RNA uh, would suggest that it's highly safe uh, in terms of the uh, uh, types of uh, toxicity or side effects that one might uh, might encounter with that vaccine. Uh, the messenger RNA is a natural substance. Uh, it is present in our cells constantly, and the body has a mechanism of uh, deactivating it and getting rid of it in such a way that uh, that there, there really is a very limited uh, risk for say side effects and toxicity. Follow up, Steve. Just yeah, just to clarify. So when you say that that uh, uh, RNA uh, vaccines have been used in cancer or uh, influenza research, is that that's on human subjects or? Yes, that's in human subjects. And the experience with that has been positive. The experience with that has been quite positive. Uh, many of these uh, uh, vaccines have been used uh, over the last several years uh, without any uh, significant side effects. And I, I would just add to that that we're gaining uh, more experience quite rapidly. Um, you may have heard about the Moderna vaccine. That's an RNA vaccine. And so far, there's no uh, safety signals in that. And in addition, the vaccine study that we're embarking on uh, is also being done in Germany at the present time, where people are currently undergoing vaccination and also appears to be uh, safe. And, Thank you. Um, before we, thank you, Steve. Before we turn to Patty Singer, I need to thank our ASL interpreters, Will, who you see on camera, and Chris, who is with them, along with Morgan Underwood from our ASL Interpreting Services group. Patty Singer, Minority Reporter, do you have a question? Uh, yes, Chip, thank you. Uh, Dr. Mendoza mentioned this too, and I'm wondering how are you going to ensure that all segments of the community have an opportunity to be enrolled in this study? So we will be monitoring our uh, volunteer pool uh, for race, race and ethnicity and making sure that we have a representative population here in Rochester. If we feel like we're not reaching communities, we'll uh, look to our community leaders, perhaps Dr. Mendoza. We have some resources here at the university uh, that interacts with uh, uh, difficult to reach communities as well. Um, okay. Yeah, Dr. Walsh, you mentioned that there already are people that you're contacting. So what are the criteria and how do you have folks who are already seemingly in, in the bullpen that you're calling on to, to be involved? Yeah, in the early stages of the vaccine study, one of the most important aspects of it is obviously safety. And so those criteria are being very 
carefully uh, scrutinized through this study. But the second and very important aspect is the immunogenicity and the type of antibody response that uh, the vaccine induces in individuals. And uh, so one of the things that we're uh, clearly screening for is uh, the, the presence of a coronavirus infection at this time, because that would confuse the response to the vaccine. So no one can have had coronavirus uh, or be infected with coronavirus at the time we do the vaccination. We actually test them prior to giving them the first dose. Uh, the other criteria are that they uh, should not have uh, lung disease, diabetes, hypertension, uh, or a BMI over 30. Uh, and the reason for those, again, is those are, are groups of patients who might be at higher risk uh, for difficulty with coronavirus infection. And we, we and actually uh, susceptible to coronavirus infection. So we want to be as certain as possible that people we vaccinate, the immune response that we see is to the vaccine and not to an intercurrent infection with coronavirus. So the initial phase of the study does involve very healthy individuals. As the study moves forward though to phases two and three, then you start to open it up and make it available to the general population, and certainly for those people who are at higher risk. Thank you, Patty. And now Berkeley Breen at WATC Channel 10. And Berkeley, I guess you got uh, one question and then your colleague has a question. Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, uh, question for Dr. Mendoza. Chip, are you able to bring up Dr. Mendoza on the full screen? Can we bring him up? I can't get him full screen up. Can you get him at all? Give us one second, Murphy. We'll see if we you got it. You got it. <laughs> no luck, Corey. Nothing at the moment. No, I'm sorry. I, um, All right. We can we can come back to you, Berkeley. If, if, if Corey, do you think we might get this fixed or? Uh, no, it's, it's, yeah. Well, I see Dr. Mendoza right there. Maybe I'll just have him right there. Yeah, <laughs> been here. <laughs> yeah, we can see him on the checkerboard. I got him right. Dr. Mendoza. All right. <laughs> All right, we'll give it a shot. All right, Dr. Mendoza. Uh, along with a vaccine, one of the ways our community is going to get back on its feet is by uh, testing. Uh, and we have to reach a certain capacity to test in Monroe County and in the Finger Lakes region. Um, what is our capacity to test right now? How many can we do in a month? Well, I don't have the exact number, but I do know that the number that we can provide is uh, much greater than the number that we need to be able to conduct in order to meet the 30 per 1,000 population metric. So if my math is right, and I think you've done the math as well, um, here in Monroe County, we'll need to do about 750 tests per day uh, or 22,000 tests per month. And uh, when you expand that out to the county, I think it's uh, 1,200 to 1,500 tests per day. And uh, I can't do the math off the top of my head, but uh, the corresponding number across the region per month. And uh, when you look at 750 per day just here in Monroe County, we easily have that capacity between the U of R, Rochester Regional, and the new site that's been established at Monroe Community College. So I think the, the greater challenge before us is in generating the demand, um, which is ironic because you know we keep hearing about how people want the test, and yet we're not yet connecting people from that demand to actually getting the test done. And so that I think is the challenge before us. Um, between the two health systems, you know, the criterion are broadening to some degree. Uh, certainly if you're an essential worker with symptoms or even asymptomatic, you are now eligible to get the testing done. All uh, you need to do is con uh, contact your healthcare provider. And uh, likewise, at, at MCC, we want to encourage people, again, in those uh, essential work uh, roles to uh, go to MCC, make an appointment first, and, and then go to MCC and get the test done. So I think the challenge really is generating the demand, not so much yet in uh, expanding the capacity. Thank you, Chip. Thanks. Uh, Berkeley, we had a second question from W uh, News 10 NBC. Yes, I'll ask that question. It's for Dr. Edwards and Dr. Falsi. Um, 
Rochester is one of four sites that uh, in the country that this test is taking place in. How important is that for the Rochester area to be part of this uh, test? And I'll just correct you, it's Dr. Ed Walsh. <laughs> Um, so I, I think it's a, an incredible privilege. Uh, it, we all understand the importance of developing an effective vaccine to end this epidemic. It's really uh, the way most people see it ending. And uh, we feel great to be you know, at the forefront, uh, one of four centers to, to begin this important program. And we're very pleased to bring it to the community. We, we have people reaching out to us all the time saying, how can I help? And uh, this gives people a way to help and give back. Thank you. Thank you. Tanner Juvenbell at 13 Ram TV. Hi, thank you. Uh, wondering how fast do you think we could have this vaccine ready for at least emergency use? You know, that, that's a very difficult question to, to answer. It, if you're talking about this specific vaccine, um, the the expanded uh, testing that would uh, be required to uh, expand the both safety data as well as the immunogenicity data, uh, that that's going to take probably uh, three, four, five months to develop, uh, and hopefully in that same time frame you start to get the data developed indicating that it is not just <clears throat> able to induce an immune response, but that that immune response protects you either from infection or from the severe disease that the virus can cause. Uh, that may take a little bit longer to develop, uh, you know, clearly uh, after the first uh, couple of phases uh, of study that are done. So it's really very difficult to say. Uh, when that uh, that could be, um, I, I've heard um, you know others uh, suggest that it, it it could be as soon as, for instance, uh, the late winter, uh, or I should say, the late part of this year. I think that is optimistic, and that would require uh, virtually everything to go very smoothly, uh, uh, which we certainly would hope uh, could be the case. Follow up, Tanner. Follow-up is for uh, Dr. Mendoza. I'm not sure if we can pull him up uh, after I ask this, but wondering um, part of the criteria for reopening is having enough contact tracers. And we saw some metrics from the governor yesterday. Um, I think we need to have 30 per 100,000. I was wondering, do you know how many we have in the area or how many we need? And if we can get enough of these contract, contract tracers ready to begin reopening the region uh, after next week. Yeah, so um, the, the uh, numeric uh, target is 361 across the region. And that's simply taking the ratio of 30 to the 100,000 population. And I would say that we're not quite there yet. No, no region, no county in the state is there yet. And so we're all engaged in our process uh, literally right now uh, in trying to build up that capacity. Um, what I will say is that while we tried to build up that capacity, I think it's important to realize that my hope is that we never need that capacity. Um, because if we can manage to keep the curve flat, then we won't need to have that uh, volume of contact tracers. But I do think that it is important to prepare in the event that we do. So that is what we're working on, uh, you know, literally as we speak. Thanks, uh, Tanner and Jeremy Rule at the City Newspaper. Hi, um, I guess, uh, let me ask kind of a basic question. The messenger RNA, what is that and why is it so, uh, so key in these vaccines? So the concept of the messenger RNA vaccine, although relatively novel, has actually been in development for you know, a decade or so. The idea is that in the past, we have usually, and with many standard vaccines, we inject proteins into individuals. Uh, these are the proteins that are components of, say, a virus like this. Uh, this happens to be a spike protein uh, messenger RNA. This is, and the concept here is rather than inject the protein, you inject the instructions to make the protein in the body. 
you put it into the cells of the person. This message is translated into the protein. And the beauty of it is that it makes the protein in the same way that the virus might make the protein. So the structure of it is exactly what you want and you're inducing the proper immune response. Uh, so this is one of the, the uh, exciting parts of a messenger RNA vaccine uh, in that it, it, it actually simulates what, a, what an infection would look like to the immune system. But you're not infecting the patient with a virus. You're simply putting in a messenger RNA, which is an instruction uh, to how the cell can make the vaccine that you want. Follow up, Jeremy? Yeah, um, just, you know, this is the latest in a string of uh, announcements about uh, COVID-19 research that uh, the University of Rochester is doing. Do these, um, so these projects all, I guess, inform each other um, kind of in the immediate sense, or is, are they more about building a um, larger body of knowledge overall? Uh, I think they do both. Um, certainly our colleagues in immunology are critical to developing the assays that we use to assess the immune response. So. Uh, the university has uh, appropriate labs to do what we call neutralization assays to see if the antibodies that are produced can actually neutralize the virus and, and kill it. Um, so in that way, they interdigitate. Um, some of the other things that we're doing at the, the university uh, complement each other. So a vaccine prevents disease. Some of the treatment trials treat the disease once you have it. Thank you. Thanks, Jeremy. And Rebecca Fath, FWROC Channel 8. Hi, everybody. Um, so my question is, uh, what is this going to look like for someone who does volunteer to be part of the clinical trial? If I, is it as simple as going in, um, getting a shot, then do they have to stay somewhere? Or how are you going to monitor it? And, um, and what is it going to look, say I'm watching and I want to say, oh, I want to get involved. What is that going to mean for me? How much time do I have to spend doing it? So it's, it's a study that will uh, have multiple visits over a, a two year period with most of the visits uh, concentrated in the first six months. And so there would be uh, an initial screening visit where we make sure people are in good health. Uh, we take a, a sample of blood to test you for antibody because as Dr. Wall said, if you've already had the infection, then we don't wanna uh, use that. Uh, it would complicate interpretation. Uh, then you would have some uh, samples taken for some screening labs and come back if you qualify for a vaccination. Uh, generally, you need to stay and be observed for a period of time. And then there would be some uh, return visits where uh, we would also, again, uh, sample blood to see if you're having an immune response. Generally, those visits are, are pretty quick, uh, roughly 15 minutes to half an hour. And we, we try to you know, make sure that there's easy places to park and people can get it in and out uh, pretty quickly. But it is a, is a commitment of time to start with on the vaccination day particular. Absolutely. Hello, Rebecca? Oh, yes. I was wondering if I got one. So um, in terms of the amount of people that you need, so I, I heard the number uh, from Dr. Mendoza throughout 750 people a day. I, is that how many? How many people in total do you think we're going to need for to be a part of this study in order to make it work as quickly and efficiently as possible? So, so phase one is always the smallest. And so here in Rochester, we're going to be looking for 90 volunteers over the next month. Okay. But these things will be uh, rapidly moving into other phases. So, and we will have other vaccine trials ongoing. So. Uh, we, we encourage everybody to contact us. We will put you in a registry uh, and see uh, who can be in which trial. Uh, because you're right, we want things to move very rapidly. Uh, so we're looking for lots of volunteers. Great, thank you so much. Thank you, Rebecca. And there is information in the news release on how people can uh, sign up. And Natasha Agri from Spectrum News. Could you unmute her? Contact tracing was already asked, but I believe I heard that phase one of the vaccine trial will start with the young. 
Can we specify that age group and how that might move forward in future phases? Yes, the, the young uh, phase is 18 through 55. And the second group, that, and, and this may seem a little odd, is actually 65 to 85. Uh, and that's a very important age group because that is the age group where we see the, the most uh, serious illness in the population. So that's a very important age group to, to study in terms of uh, the immunogenicity uh, of this vaccine. And eventually, uh, we'll fill in that gap that I just mentioned, and it will be from 18 to 85 uh, will be the age group that we'll be uh, studying this vaccine. Yeah. That's all for me. I appreciate it. Thank you. Some of us are in the 55 to 65 age group that are not able to participate, but I'm trying not to take offense. Um, <laughs> oh, we'll have a place well, that, for that's you. That's only in the very early <laughs> stages. <laughs> and um, batting cleanup, we'll ask her for Rochester Beacon. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, my uh, first question is uh, for uh, Dr. Falsi and Dr. Walsh. Um, it, it, to clarify uh, your answer to Jeremy Moore from City concerning the nature of the mRNA virus, I mean, um, uh, vaccine. Does this not involve genetic material from the pathogen? So the, the messenger RNA is synthetically produced. In other words, it's it's only a portion of the same sequence that is present in the virus. Now, the, as I pointed out, the spike protein, <laughs> protein on the surface of the virus, to which we want to induce antibody, because we know antibody to that spike protein uh, can neutralize the virus and prevent it from attacking and infecting your cells. And so the uh, piece of messenger RNA that we're using is limited to that uh, small protein, uh, and in fact, a uh, portion of that small protein. And I okay. would, I would yeah. just add to that explanation because it, it might sound like this is a, an overly complicated way to make a vaccine um, regarding the protein. So if you inject the protein, uh, one of the older ways, it, it's worked in some instances to to make a vaccine is that they would formalin inactivate a virus. And so they would kill it. And in doing that, sometimes you alter the important proteins such that they don't produce the, the right immune response. So the, the feeling here is that by allowing the, the body's own cells to you know, give the message to, to make the protein, it, it's a more natural way to express the protein and you get a better, more natural immune response. And a final question, Will? Uh, yeah, for Dr. Mendoza uh, on another topic. Um, the, uh, uh, yesterday, uh, Governor Cuomo uh, uh, mentioned as part of the flattening the curve effort that hospital capacity uh, be kept to 70% uh, is, uh, occupancy. Is that, uh, is that the standard that is being applied here? Yes. That is, I mean, certainly our hospitals have been very engaged in that because uh, the hospitals know better than anybody else uh, what might happen if the surge were to take place. And so they have anybody have a very vested interest in trying to retain that capacity in the event that we need it here in the region. So the balance really going forward is um, trying to utilize as much of the capacity as possible to provide the, uh, you know, important care that our residents uh, need while also preserving that available capacity if and when we uh, might need it. So obviously we all hope that we never need it, but uh, part of preparedness is knowing that uh, sometimes you can't prevent everything. So our goal is simply to be prepared. Is that, is that a standard that, that uh, uh, goes forward indefinitely or if uh, we, uh, through a vaccine, maintain herd immunity, does, uh, do we revert to the old uh, uh, occupancy standards? I think uh, for right now, um, you know, we're looking at this, you know, really very much on a, a rolling basis. I think that's the standard that will be in place until anything big changes. Certainly the presence of a treatment or a vaccine will be a big deal. 
uh, and we're not quite there yet. So for the foreseeable future, we're going to be wanting to retain that 70% target uh, until the, until uh, there's further notice. Thank you, Will. And uh, I'll apologize to everyone, but especially Dr. Mendoza. We were delighted you could join us today. Uh, Dr. Mendoza, I'm sorry we had a technical glitch so we couldn't see you on the full screen. But I'll ask before we wrap up if you'd like to make any uh, final comments about the vaccine trial or COVID-19 in the community. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. And again, thank you to Dr. Walsh and Dr. Falsey for your leadership on this very important trial. Um, I think this is a great example of the collaboration, as I mentioned earlier uh, in our remarks. And I do think that this uh, you know, stands not only to keep us on the map as far as research, uh, I wanna caution the public that good research takes time. And while this is very promising and certainly a very important step in the right direction, um, we still need to find that patience that we need to keep going with what we've been so successful at, at accomplishing together so far. So you know, maintaining our social distancing, hand hygiene, effective disinfection, and uh, wearing those cloth face coverings. I think those will be uh, the rule of the day for the foreseeable future while we await the exciting news that we hopefully will learn uh, from trials like the ones we are announcing today. So with that, I wanted to thank both the U of R and Rochester Regional for your, your partnership and your collaboration. And I, I wish you both uh, the, the best of science ahead. Anything from the doctors? Would you like to Yes, well, I, I, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, get the message out. Uh, we're looking forward to a, a successful study, and, you know, hopefully this is represents the beginning of the end. And Dr. Walsh, any final thought from you? Yeah, I just uh, want to comment on the collaboration between the two health systems. Uh, you know, one of the things about infectious disease, and we've seen this over the last uh, 30 or 40 years that I've been uh, working in both systems is infections do not respect systems. <laughs> and uh, infections always cross all lines. And it's really a group effort. All right. Uh, we'll call that the last word. Thank you all, Dr. Ann Falvey, Dr. Ed Walsh, Dr. Martin Mendoza, our, uh, all of our colleagues in the media, uh, Will and Chris and Morgan from ASM Presentation. <laughs> Uh, any questions, follow up, email us at mediainquiries at urmc.rochester.edu. Thanks, Corey, for the Zoom and Jeff me for the panel work. And we will call it a wrap. Thank you. Thanks, Chip. Thank